I'm glad you're here tonight, and I didn't run everybody off this morning. <laughs> Although I got accused of, of uh, putting a target on the back of somebody's car. <laughs> I wasn't giving up names or nothing. But <laughs> All right. This evening, I want to invite you to turn with me to a, a passage probably most of you can quote. Psalms 23. Psalms 23. I'll give you a minute to get there if you need to be. Uh, and then we'll read. I'll, I'll go ahead and qualify. I don't think I will make it through the entire psalm, but I want to make a few comments on uh, some of it. Uh, just an encouragement, if you will. Sure. Would you stand in the honor of reading God's word? All right. Psalms 23, verse 1. And if you just feel like you need to, you can join with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He let it lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life and he leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm sorry, I forgot I was, didn't have my King James with me, so that I threw, threw everybody off. So. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you. you may be seated. I have about a, a dozen versions, and I, I just grab one off the top of my desk, and here we are. But you know that the Lord is my shepherd. And, and when you look at, the, when I think about the 23rd Psalm, so often we, we hear it, we read it, and we associate it with funerals. A lot of times, because it's, it's printed on a lot of the, the bulletins and things at funerals. But I, I just well, I want to consider it tonight. David wrote this Psalm probably in the latter part of his life. Um, and David had, if anybody knew uh, what it meant to be a shepherd, it was David. Because what did he do prior to becoming king? He was a shepherd boy. That's what he did. And, you know, we think of, of sheep, shepherds, livestock. We put them in a pasture, fence around them. We drive in our truck out there and we take a look at them every now and then. But in David's day, a shepherd, he spent all of his time in the field with those sheep. Uh, and so when David comes along and he says, the Lord is my shepherd, what does that mean? What, what credentials does the Lord have to be his shepherd? When you think about a shepherd and what's a, what would be a shepherd's role, he was totally responsible for those sheep, right? Their life, what they eat, their protection, everything, he was responsible for that. And when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, He's saying God is, is the one who takes care of me. He is my manager. He's my shepherd. He's my owner. I'm under his control and his watchful eye. Well, I just, I guess maybe I should ask, is he your shepherd? We easily say, yes, the Lord's my shepherd. But are we willing to follow that shepherd? Are we willing to follow after him? Are we willing to allow him to be our owner, to be the one in control? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, didn't he? In John chapter 10, he talks about him he being the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. Uh, when you, you think about that term, the Lord being my shepherd, if you will, uh, it really implies a, a profound uh, but practical relationship between you and your Savior. Because doesn't a shepherd have a practical relationship? Yes, he was responsible for them. And when you think about Christ being our shepherd, you go to Colossians chapter 1, all things were created by him, through him, for him. He's, he's responsible for it all. The, the world spinning on the very axis that it does is because God does so. 
He's responsible for all those things. He is able to do all those things. But yet he has, a, just like the shepherd has a very practical relationship with those sheep. Because as David being a shepherd of those sheep, he knew them well enough that they knew his voice. He knew when this one was sick, when that one was sick. Friend, the mayor in Huntsville, we were talking one day about this in class, and he was, uh, uh, years ago, he was working over in, uh, in Africa where they still shepherd sheep the same way David did. And he said, I happened to go outside one morning and I was watching and <clears throat> there was a, a, a cave area where they had all of these sheep piled in there and there were several men out in front of it. He said, I'm just watching from a distance. He said, and all of a sudden one of the shepherds steps up and he begins to speak into there and, and start walking. He said, not all of the sheep come out, just his. He said, y'all always heard that, but I saw that in action. He said he called his sheep out of that pen, and his sheep come because they knew his voice. It, because of a personal relationship. In other words, he, those sheep knew him, they trusted him, they were willing to follow him because he had proven himself to be worthy of following. Is Jesus worthy of following how, is he trustworthy? Can we trust him? How do we know we can trust him? What did he do for us? Not on the cross, right? He, he went to the cross where he laid his, even in Jesus' words, he laid his life down. And the good shepherd's willing to lay his life down for his sheep and he picked it back up. He gave it all for us. He's worthy to follow. So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, when we say the Lord is my shepherd, we, just, we decide that we have now become the object of his divine attention. The creator of all things, God Almighty, has taken a special interest in you because you've decided you want to be his sheep and you want to follow him. You want to call him master. You want to call him your shepherd. David understood that. As you think about the life of David, and as I said, he probably wrote this later in his life. When he was anointed king, there was a period of time. There were several years before David even was old enough, 15, 16, 17 years before he ever stepped into that role at any kind. And in that period of time, the current king tried to do what for years? And he didn't just try to kill him when he ran across him. He chased after him continually and during that period of time who took care of David the Lord did the Lord looked after him so when David said the Lord is my shepherd he had an understanding of of what that meant it meant more than <clears throat> he's just God he is he is the one that cares for me he looks after me he restores us <clears throat> and the, a shepherd excuse me a shepherd and his sheep uh, besides just them knowing his voice, they would notch them. Some of you guys know what it's like to notch the ear of, a, of an animal, a pig, or a cow, whatever. Uh, some of you people know that. Uh, I remember as a kid, we used to do that all the time for my granddad. We'd notch the ears, and, and Pop had a, sw a swallow fork deal he put in his. We knew, because that way, everybody knew, oh, that's, uh, that's Burnett's pig. That's so -so. Knew it because of the notches. Well, if we belong to the Lord, has he marked you? What has he sealed you with? Yeah, he bought us with his blood and he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. He has put his stamp on you. You're his. The world should look at you and say, I know who you belong to. Because he's put his seal on you. You are his. You're a sheep in his pasture. Uh, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not have a need. We, <clears throat> in, in Africa, we built a building for our special needs children to come to, and we use it for teaching and training and those kind of things, and we call it the Jireh House. Jehovah Jireh means God is our, is our provider. God provides for those things. David says he's not just my shepherd, he's my provider. 
He provides what I need. He provides those things to me. It's, it's a concept of not lacking or being deficient in anything. I, just think about some of the men in Scripture. I'm, I'm going to play on your mind. I know you you know these characters. Elijah. You remember Elijah? He goes to the top of Mount Carmel. He faces off with 850 of false prophets, calls fire down from heaven. God consumes the altar, and he walks away, and soon Jezebel gets after him. And what does he do? Do anybody remember what he does? What does Elijah do? He's out of there, right? He runs. He runs and he gets out there under this broom tree and he says, I've had enough, just kill me. Who took care of him? God, he came. He met his needs. He fed him. He he, he fed him. He watered him. He put an angel to watch over him so Jezebel wouldn't get to him. He took care of him. He allowed him to rest. Even prior to Mount Carmel, when he was hiding in the caves, he fed him with the ravens, did he not? He took care of him. God is God meets our needs always. David, did he always meet David's needs? Yes, he always did. John the Baptist, Paul. Paul made the, sta- made the statement he had learned to be content in every situation. Learn to be content. Well, if the Lord is your shepherd and he meets your needs, does that mean you're going to have everything you want? What? No. There's a difference in want and need, right? Now let me take a step further. Spiritual need. Not just your physical. Because we can go without some of, this, some of these items... A long time. But our spiritual needs, we can't go without those things being met. We get spiritually hungry. We get spiritually deprived and we, we begin to fade in our relationship. God will meet those needs if you allow Him to be your shepherd and you follow after Him. You know, we just like a sheep, uh, cows uh, do it too walk along and, and they're in a pasture with plenty of green grass and they got their head through the fence eating grass on the other side, right? You know what I'm talking about? Grass is always greener. Is it really? If we follow our shepherd, he's going to meet what we need. He's going to meet what we need. Even if we, ha- we have a need, we don't know what direction to turn. We have a situation in our life. Where do I go? What do I do with this? We- can God give you that direction? If you're willing to seek his face, he'll show you. You shall not want. He's not going to leave you hanging out by yourself. He says, not only the Lord is my shepherd, I have, uh, I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. Let me give you a little, I don't have, we have any shepherds in here? We anybody raise sheep that's in here? I've not either done a lot of reading and research. Just going to qualify that. Jehovah, Jehovah Shalom, or peace. He makes me lie down in green pastures. A sheep will not lie down to rest if there's four things that are hanging out to dry. If he's fearful, he will not lay down. If he's, he's, he's in fear, he won't lay down. If he's, uh, he's not free from friction with other sheep, if the other sheep, they're, they're fighting with one another, He's not going to lay down because there's friction going on in the, in the group. He won't lay down. He's fearful if there's friction going on or if he's not free of pest and parasites and flies. They're bothering you. You ever been somewhere there's a lot of flies and gnats doing like this? A sheep will not lay, lay down and rest if that's taking place. Last thing, if he feels like there, he has to search for food, he will not rest. So when, when he said, when David says, he, the, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want, he lets me to lie down in green pastures. It's not just taking you somewhere there's food. And that green pastures he's talking about is lush, fresh, green grass. That tender stuff that comes out early that makes it easy for sheep to eat. They, he don't, he, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, did he? 2 Timothy uh, 1.7, he didn't give us that. His desire for you and I is to have peace and contentment, is it not? 
Do our circumstances dictate our peace, joy, and contentment? It shouldn't, but we allow them to. It should not. Our peace should not depend on the situations that we're in. Our peace should depend upon our relationship with Christ Jesus. Because if you're walking with Him you're, and you trust Him, He's your shepherd, you know you're not going to have need for anything, you know He's going to provide what you need, He's going to make it where you can lie down, where you're not fear of anything, you're not being uh, bothered by anything, you're not worried about whether you're going to eat again. All those things are aside. He's going to take care of that regardless of your situation. Because he is able. Because where does true peace come from? Does it come from circumstances being all happy? Or does it come from him? What, is, what did Jesus say? Peace I leave with you. So peace comes from him, does it not? What about joy? Does he provide that? Yes, he provides joy. So those things come from Christ. They don't come from our circumstances. It's our relationship with Him that's important. <clears throat> if you, excuse me, uh, if we, we had time, we'd look at Ezekiel chapter 34. God talks about that, that, sh that good shepherd, what He desires out of a shepherd. He, he's, he's actually, He's kind of uh, fussing at Israel and some of the shepherds because they're not doing what they're supposed to. And He said, this is what you are to be doing. And He, and he lays those things out in Ezekiel uh, chapter 34. Uh, but sheep... And people in church. I, I hate to say this, but we are remarkably like sheep. Remarkably like sheep. Sheep, just like any other animal, just like people, they will, they will fight until they get a pecking order. There is a lead sheep. And there's one that's the end of the line, and they're going to fuss and fight till they determine that pecking order. Do we as people do that? Oh, ain't nobody admitting that, but we do, do we not? We do, we do that. We, we fight for a pecking order, if you will, trying to become that top sheep. Paul says that he learned to be content in whatever the circumstance, so those circumstances shouldn't, shouldn't matter. Uh, wherever we're at, whatever the circumstance is in. But just like a sheep, and, and I'll put it in relation to a church, there can be, can be scrabble for that pecking order until the preacher walks in and everybody's... You know what I'm talking about? Sheep do the same thing. They, they squabble and fight for that pecking order until the shepherd shows up because when he's there, who's in charge? Shepherd. Shepherd's in charge, Right? Is the shepherd ever missing in our life? He's always in charge. Instead of us worrying about what Susie or Harry or Larry's doing, we need to be worried about what the shepherd's doing and what he wants me to do. Because he gives us our place, right? Is, and when you think about that place, if you will, and serving the Lord instead of worrying about that rivalry, if you will, we keep our eyes on the master, it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. Uh, you know, if we fight for that position, if you will, or that uh, place of prominence, if that's your primary deal, you will never have peace. Because even if you obtain it, you're going to always be worried about somebody taking it. But if the only thing you're worried about is your relationship with the shepherd and being where he wants you to be. Can you imagine maybe the, the shepherd says, uh, okay, look here, I, I want you to be at the back. I know you've been doing this a long time. You've been following me a long time. And you really like to be up here next to me. But I want you to be at the back to make sure everybody comes along. Well, I don't want to be back there. I want to be up here. I want to be at the front. Anybody ever like to be at the front? Front of the line? There's a few of y'all. <laughs> I wasn't picking at you. I knew you was one of them. But. We need to learn to keep our eyes on the master, if you will. And there's a, there's a saying when we think about uh, our place as a sheep in, in relationship with the master. If you plant daisies 
underneath a particular tree, where do you expect them to bloom? Where you planted them, right? So wherever God has planted you, whatever position, whatever place, whatever job God has given you, whatever place in life he's put you at, that's where you're supposed to bloom. That's where you're supposed to be productive for him where he puts you. Not where you want to be because you're not in charge anymore. Who's in charge? The shepherd, right? The shepherd's in charge. So we have to allow him to, to place us where he desires for us to be. If we learn to keep our eyes on him, everything else doesn't really matter, does it? It doesn't really matter if we keep our eyes on him. Learning to be content. Let me, let me think about it. A sheep will not lay down in that green pasture. Will not, will not, and it's important that a sheep uh, lays down in that pasture because a sheep does not grow and stay healthy without proper rest. And when they lay is when they, like an old cow, they chew their cud. That's when they, their gut does what it's supposed to do. So if they don't lay down, they don't stay healthy. They don't rest. They're nervous. Uh, so when you, when you think about that, uh, in in the being in that green pasture and lying down is important. It's important that we feel comfortable enough to rest under the watchful eye of our Lord. Pestilence. I said, you know, a sheep will not lay down if they're if they're not free of, of pests and flies and those kind of things. Do we allow pest troubles in our lives? It causes us to fret and to worry and carry burdens that we shouldn't carry. Sure we do. We don't rest when we're worried about stuff, do we? You ever laid, it, laid awake at night and your mind's just going, and you're worried about something? Is that what God desires for us? No. We need to learn to give it to Him. Give it to Him. Uh, what about free from hunger? Is God going to allow you to starve You ever heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? God has given us all we need to eat right here. But if you don't, if you don't, if you don't belly up to the table here and consume a little bit of what he's got for you, you're going to be hungry. I, I, I honestly believe churches today are full of Christians that are anemic. Because they do not feast on God's word. They do. They don't feast on it. They don't spend any. The only time they, they get into God's word is when they come in here on Sunday and the preacher says, turn to such and such. And that's the only scripture they've read all week long. It used to just kill me when I was pastoring over at Faith. After service and everybody gone, I go through there and everybody's Bibles were laying where they were sitting. I'm like, what are you reading during the week? Are we feasting on his word? He's given us, he's given us the best green pastures to, to feed in. We don't have to worry about those things, but we have to be willing to consume some of it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me to lie down in green pastures. He takes me to those places. What if I don't want to follow him? What if I don't want to go to that green pasture? I want to stay where I'm at. I don't want to go to I don't want to go to Sunday school today. I don't want to go to church. Am I meddling yet? I don't want to go to church. I don't want to get up five minutes early and have a short devotional. I don't want to do that. Is that God's fault? No, it's ours, right? It's ours. So we have to be willing to let him lead us to those green pastures where we can eat. Lead us to those things. <clears throat> that green pasture, if you will, and friction from other things. Uh, I will just read a little piece to you written by a guy named Philip Keller. It says, He works to clear our lives of rocks of unbelief. He tries to tear out roots of bitterness. He attempts to break up the hard, proud human heart that is set up like sun-dried clay. He then sows the seed of his own precious word, which if given a chance to grow will produce contentment and peace. He waters it with the dew of the rain of his own presence, the Holy Spirit that is, 
He tends and he cares and he cultivates the life longing to see it become rich, green, and productive. See, green pastures don't just happen. The green pastures he's talking about, they don't just happen in the wilderness. It takes work by the shepherd. Your shepherd has worked to provide you a place where green pastures are at, where you can come and feast and leave full. He's done those things. Then he works daily in our lives. Just like, just like Philip Keller said here, he works to move those rocks of unbelief. Do we have unbelief in our life sometimes? Oh, yeah, absolutely we do. Absolutely. Bitterness. Do we allow things to make us bitter? And he, he, he addresses those things in our life to remove them so that we have greener pastures to eat in. But we have to be willing to follow him to those pastures and consume what he's laid before us. Well, if we just learn to follow him and consume some of his word, consume some of it. <clears throat> he says, he leads me beside quiet waters. Why is those quiet waters important? Sheep are not billy goats. Billy goats are sure-footed. They can climb the side of a rock face. A sheep, you can go, boo, and they fall over. They cannot walk up to running water, to fast-moving water, and get a drink because if they lean too far and they get wet, they fall in, they drown because that wool just carries them, carries them off. It carries them off. So a, a shepherd will take, and, and even in running water, he'll pull up a little spot where that water will come up and get still, where they can eat, where they can drink. See, our, our shepherd looks for safe places to water you, to give you refreshment. He looks for those places. He, he don't just, hey, there's some water over there, get you some. He leads you to a place such as this, such as Riverside Baptist, provides an under-shepherd here that provides a good place, good study of the Word. He, fit, he waters you. He looks for those places. That shepherd doesn't leave it to the wind because he cares for you and wants you to grow. He wants to provide those things for you. A safe place, that still water to come get a drink, if you will. <clears throat> you see, he, then he says, he, he restoreth my soul. I don't know about you, but that's one of my favorite pieces in there. He restoreth my soul. Sometimes we get weary, do we not? You ever get weary? Elijah got weary. He said, I don't know that broom tree. He said, okay, I'm done, Lord. Just take me out. I'm the only one left. Just kill me and be done with it. But that's not what God did. He restored him. How did he restore him? I want you, we, could, we, we could, should go there and look, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. You remember after that, he, after he rests there under that broom tree, the Lord tells him, he says in, in 1 Kings 19, you can read that when you get home, he tells him, rest right here. He says, because you've got a long trip ahead of you. And he takes him to the mountain. And he hides him in the cleft of the rock. And he passes by. The presence of our Lord restores our soul. When you're weary, and you can, say, you can sit in here and say, Oh, I don't ever get weary. I'm strong. Okay. Talk to me afterwards. I want to know your secrets. We get weary sometimes. I... <laughs> Years ago, some of you know or may not know, there was a period of time around 2000 to, and I don't know, 2010 or so, my wife probably spent as much time in the hospital as she did at home. Kay remembers that. And it had been a particularly long spell of her being tremendously sick. I mean, the doctors actually gave her three years to live in 1999. Well, you always see who's in charge, right? Shepherd is. But I, I share, I'm sharing this to say that, that I, began, I, I was weary of not knowing if I was going to have her the next day or not. And I left the hospital and I come home and I got the kids to bed and I went into my bedroom and I just wept. 
I said, Lord, I don't know how much more I can take. I'm weary. You know what God said to me? He said, just worship me for a few minutes. So I got a pair of headphones and, that, and put in a, a tape back when they had those. Put that tape in and turned it on. And I sat there for a few minutes and I just cried with the Lord. Which, well, I'm a guy. I don't do that. Well, that's all right. I did. I just worshiped. I worshiped. And you know what took place during that period of time of being in his presence? Because he inhabits the praises of what? His people. So when you begin, you come into his presence, you begin to worship him. It's just like he washed me. It was just a washing. I felt restored. I felt like Elijah must have felt under that tree after God ministered to him. I, I, was, when I got up from there and I thought, okay, I'm ready. I can go another 10 years. Whatever it takes, Lord, I'm ready. Because it wasn't about me. It wasn't about anything I did. I just sought to be in his presence for a few minutes. Because see, when you get in the presence of the good shepherd, he meets all of your needs. He restores your soul and sets you back up on your feet and says, okay, go back to work, boy. I got you. Are we willing to take time out and get in his presence? A lot of times, I, I, I find myself still. I find myself when I get weary and worn from those things, oh, the first thing I want to do is try to figure out a way to fix it or just whine about it. Anybody ever whine about stuff? I'm glad there's a few folks in here with me. <clears throat> you know, even, even the strongest, even the strongest become weary sometimes. In the sheep world, if you will, there's times that sheep need restoration because they, they become what's called cast are cast down. When a sheep falls over where all four feet are sticking out and they're not, can't get, get them on the ground, they can't get up. They're like a turtle. They're stuck. They're cast. That's what a shepherd calls it. They're cast. They, they fall on their back, their feet sticking in there, they can't get back up right, and if they stay in that position long enough, they die because they can't eat, they can't drink, they begin their their Rumi begins to swell and they get bloated and those kind of things. But even the healthiest of sheep will find themselves in that position sometimes. Even the strongest and healthiest ones will find themselves in a cast position because what happens is sometimes they become long fleeced. They get long fleeced and they, they, they look for a place in that green pasture and here's a, here's a little there's a little wallered out spot and that sheep will lay down in it the next thing you know he stretches out and he gets comfortable and boom, he's cast. He can't get up. We ever get too comfortable sometimes in our walk and we kind of fall over and we're pawing and we can't get up? We get lazy, if you will. But sometimes a sheep will do that they can't get back on their feet, if you will. <clears throat> but our shepherd... The good shepherd, what does he say if he's got a hundred sheep and one's missing? What does he do? He's going to go find it. He's going to find it. He's going to leave the other 99 right over here all together, and he's going to go find that one and put him back up on his feet. But see, the, the, the unique thing about when a shepherd finds that lost sheep to get him back up, if he lays there long enough, you ever laid somewhere long enough that your legs went to sleep and tried to get up? You, 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 you can't do it, can you? Well, that somewhat happens to a sheep. So when that shepherd finds him in that cast position, when the Lord finds you down and, and you're cast, if you will, if we, those terms, when you're, when you're weary, you don't just stand you back up on the feet. Like that shepherd, he gets you back up and he holds you there for a little while. He holds you there for a little while. Think back to when you was a child. You sit down on the couch next to mama and she just reaches over and she just kind of pets on you a little bit, loves on you and squeezes on you. you just, ah, things are good, right? Our Lord, when you, he stands you back up on, the, on your feet. He holds you there until you get your feet back up under yourself. And then he pushes you along the way. He don't just yank you up and stand you on your feet because you fall right back over. 
He picks you up when he finds you in that position because he's going to find you. Because is there anywhere that's outside the eye of our Lord? No. So you can't fall somewhere that he don't know. He sees it happen, does he not? He sees it happen. Uh, <clears throat> but like that sheep, sometimes we find a comfortable place to lie down and we get that, that attitude. We kind of let our guard down. We, we uh, take our armor off. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Take our armor off and get relaxed. Who's watching when we take our armor off and we get relaxed in the Lord sometimes? Right. Devil's looking, right? He's looking. Be careful. Sometimes a sheep, when they get too much wool, it gets very long, it gets very matted, it gets filled with debris and mud and etc. Uh, <clears throat> and because of that, that sheep is tending to fall over because it gets too heavy. They get off balance. So what does the shepherd need to do to help that sheep stay on his feet? He's got to clean some of that debris out, right? He has to get rid of some of those things. He's got to shave a little bit of that off so that that sheep can stand up. That, that debris, do we not get the world on us a little bit sometimes? We, can't, we end up picking up things in, in the world around us. And we're carrying along things we are to let go of. And, and let, the, let, the shep, let the good shepherd, because isn't the, the good Lord good about showing you? You know, you really need to repent of that. You really need to put that away. You really need to walk away from that. You really shouldn't be a part of that. God's good at that if we just listen. He'll clean that out, if you will. He'll remove that, uh, the wool, if you will. And let me just, let me share this little piece. Um, because the wool itself is really picks up a lot of things in the world. And the wool represents, even in, in Scripture, a lot of times it represented worldly things. Uh, even to the point the high priest was not allowed to wear wool garments. You go to Ezekiel and you look, and he, they were not allowed to wear wool because it represented something of pride and of worldliness. We have to be careful what we take upon ourselves what we take upon ourselves that weighs us down. Then sometimes, uh, one last thing. Man, where did time go? <clears throat> sometimes a sheep, when you think about him, uh, him restoring our soul, that sheep just gets fat. He, get, he gets fat, and I'm not talking, I mean, the sheep gets physically fast, fat, and they become a, uh, a risk of being cast or falling in that place, if you will, uh, but sometimes for us as people, and I'm not talking physically, but we can get successful in, the, in our life, prosperous, and think we just don't need what God's got. Next thing you know, we find ourselves laying over on our side and we can't get up because we've put God off to the side. We've got comfortable with what we're doing, what we're doing. Material success, if you will, is no measure of spiritual success, is it? You look in Scripture at, uh, would you say Paul was successful as a Christian? What about Peter, James, John, John the Baptist? You think they were successful as Christians? Most of them probably didn't have much more than a couple of pennies to rub together, and they all died horribly ways but were they successful in the kingdom of God yes why because they sought to follow the shepherd one word about worldly things so just like a shepherd if you will has a sheep that's a little bit fat he puts him on a diet plan he does he has to put him on a diet plan sometimes the Lord has to put us on, on a path, if you will, to become spiritually healthier. We talked about that a little bit this morning in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Getting rid of some of those things that ensnare us and weigh us down, right? We have to put some of those things aside. He promises that he will not allow greater temptation to come upon us than we can endure or yield away from through him. 
Now you try to do it by yourself, you're in trouble. But through him, we can, we can withstand those things. Why? Because he put his seal on us. Did he not? If we're his sheep, he notched your ear with the Holy Spirit, you're his. You're his. Then he guides us in a path of righteousness. For whose sake? His name's sake. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because he's with us. Because he's with us. I'm going to stop. There is so much more to be said there, but I'm going to stop because it's, it's 730. Uh, uh. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I challenge you sometimes to just read that and think about that relationship of a shepherd and a sheep. And the fact that a holy God chooses to be with you, to watch over you, to care for you every moment of every day. We just need to be willing to follow him. When he comes to the door and says, Kyle, come on, let's go. When he says, don't go over there, don't go over there. Because he leads you in those right paths. He knows. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this evening. As we've considered just a little bit you being our shepherd. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you love us. Lord, you don't just love us, but you care about every, little, every need. Lord, you, you even promise us if we seek after you, if we follow you, you'll take care of all those things to be added unto us. Lord, may we learn to, to hear your voice, to follow you when you call, Lord, and not stray from the path that you put before us. Lord, forgive us where we have failed you. Lord, forgive us for our unbelief. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I didn't get very far, did I?